The question Jesus is asked by the Pharisees in our gospel uh, text for today, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not, is a lot like another question you uh, sometimes hear today. Uh, is America a Christian nation? It seems like an innocent uh, question, uh, but sometimes it can be a trick question in the way that uh, at least some people use it uh, because they're trying to find out uh, what you truly believe about America. Uh, and if you answer no, then, well, then you must be a communist, of course. And if you answer yes, well, then you must be a, a theocrat. But in truth, uh, there is much more nuance to that question, and especially to that answer. And in the truest sense, a nation, uh, because a nation can't be baptized, a nation, uh, so to speak of it as being a Christian nation or not, maybe not, maybe not be the, the most helpful thing. Uh, plus, it really isn't how God himself speaks. Remember, Jesus said over and over, my kingdom is not of this world. And that's again what he does in our text. So when the Pharisees ask him, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? They essentially want Jesus to say, no, our country is a godly nation. Caesar doesn't deserve our taxes. God and country, let's kick out those pagan rulers and turn our country back to God. Because if Jesus says this, they've got it. The Herodians, whom they've brought with him, those people that are loyalists to Herod, if Jesus says God and country, they'll report him as an insurrectionist because to them, the Roman emperor was God. But if Jesus says, yes, you should give to Caesar, then it's as if he's acknowledging the Roman emperor as God. And that's a problem too. And besides, the Jews don't want to be told that they're subject to anyone, let alone foreign Caesar. But Jesus says neither. Instead, he has them bring a coin, which is interesting because they've got one, thereby acknowledging the fact that they are dependent on Caesar, even though they'd rather not admit it. Jesus asks them whose image is on it. Well, Caesar's, of course. And he says, therefore, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. In so doing, Jesus is teaching us something very profound about the kingdom of God. The Pharisees are thinking that these are two equal but separate kingdoms, God and country. But this really is a false way of thinking about the kingdom of God and the world. See, God's kingdom is not merely a little corner of our lives, something like, a, like an office job that that we can separate from the rest of our lives, that religion could be lived out on Sundays, and that we can go about the rest of our secular lives the rest of the week. And the only thing we have to do then is to keep balance, God before country, as long as I give more time to God than I do my country, well then I'm good. But first of all, that's entirely subjective. One's idea of civic duty would be completely different than another's idea and more so, it's a, it's a confusion of law and gospel. If it were true, God's kingdom would be a kingdom of works, of the law. My entrance to it would be dependent on what I could do for God, and I would have no need for Jesus. No, the God of the Bible is not the God of civic religion. And secondly, God's kingdom is not merely a little corner of my life. God's kingdom encompasses everything, Everything in my life, every vocation I have, my vocation in the home or in the state, including my vocation as citizen of whatever country I may be in, uh, is, is, is fundamentally shaped by my citizenship in God's kingdom. And I can't separate that. My vocation in the home is a direct result of God placing me in that home. My vocation as a citizen in the state is a direct result of God placing me in that state and placing certain authorities over me, whether or not I may like them. And so while a national kingdom is not the same thing as God's kingdom, at the same time, strictly speaking, there is no separation between sacred and secular or church and state. We live in both kingdoms at the same time. 
And but, and this is the brilliance of Jesus' response, different things are owed to each of the two. So what we need to be careful then is giving to Caesar that which belongs to God. It would be ignorant to believe that those areas of my life, which we consider to be secular, things like public school or entertainment or our country in general or even the great American pastime of sports, uh, that they don't and aren't uh, sacred, that they don't have or teach religion. Our catechism defines a God and therefore a religion as whatever you trust, fear, love, and trust the most. Well, all those things teach individuals to love something, and usually that something is not God. And perhaps now, finally, some of these institutions are finally being honest about what it is they're actually teaching. But the solution is not to give to Caesar that which belongs to God as if Caesar should teach the gospel, or, if we should for, or, or we should force people to pray, or demand the nation convert to Christianity. But rather, that we pray that Caesar would retain that which is his, that we lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. And even if God should permit our country to come to an end, we Christians would not lose our identity. Likewise, we in the church should retain what God has given to us, that we preach the gospel, that we support our churches and preachers of the word, that we pray for our leaders, that we teach our children, that we care for the sick, the widows, fatherless, and dying, that our homes are havens of the gospel, that our whole lives, not just an hour, are reflections of Christ's love for us. And that, as Paul instructs, that we avoid foolish quarrels about the law because these are useless and fruitless, and that we Christians are citizens of a greater country. You see the image on your service folder, which also happens to be the symbol on our pulpit. It's called the cross and the orb, or the cross of victory. It's the cross above the world. And it's a symbol of triumph, or the triumph of the gospel throughout all the world, that Christ has ascended and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, having all things under his rule. All authority in heaven and on earth is in place by God. And this is the same symbol, by the way, that you'll see just about on any church steeple. Uh, Look at any church, almost any church steeple, and you'll see not just a cross, but a cross above an orb, a cross above the world. The idea is that when you enter the church, you are being reminded of your true citizenship in heaven. There's another picture that I like that shows this dual citizenship that we hold And it's one of the most common depictions of the church, and you see it right over here. The depiction of the the church as a ship. A ship traveling from one world to the next. It used to be standard for a ship uh, traveling from one country to another, especially immigrant ships, that it would fly uh, the flag of origin in the rear. So whatever country it came from, Norway or Germany, that flag would fly in the rear. And once the ship entered into international waters, Uh, those on board would be subject, uh, no longer subject to any particular country. But they would fly a new flag in the front, the flag of destination. So if the ship was traveling to America, it would fly the American flag in the front, or the Canadian flag, or wherever it was going. The church is a ship. In a sense, you are no longer American when you enter this building. You are, as it were, in international waters. And here we focus not on the present, but on what is to come. We journey not under a flag, but under the cross. And although you can't see them, you are joined by travelers from all over the world, from every nation, 
every tribe, every people, every language. Although you can't see them, because there is no such thing as an American church, or German church, or Korean church, or Chinese church, or, or whatever. As you confessed earlier, there is only one holy Christian and apostolic church, or the communion of saints. There's one more thing to know about the kingdom of, of God that we are citizens of. God's kingdom is not a kingdom of the law, but a kingdom of grace. I don't get into it, I don't live in it by giving anything to God. I'm in it and I live in it by God giving everything to me. In fact, the right way to render the things uh, that are God's to God is simply to believe. As Jesus himself said in John 6, this is the work of God to believe in the one he has sent. So great is Jesus' love for you that he was willing to come under the law of a particular country at a particular time to be rejected by his own people and to be crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate a man he, had, he himself had given authority to. And there on the cross, Jesus renders to God only the things that he could render. Payment for all our debt of sin, a tax we could never pay. But in so doing, Jesus has made you a citizen of heaven. He has brought you through the portal of your baptism, in his death and resurrection, you are now a citizen of that heavenly country that will never fall. Nations will rise and fall. Kingdoms will come and go. Flags will be raised and lowered. But God's kingdom will stand forever. And thanks be to God, you're in that kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, forevermore.